Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, sitting next to Jeff Gannon from Focus Compounding. Jeff, how are we doing today? I'm doing very well, Andrew. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. We hope everyone is having a great day. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about the income statement and its relationship to the cash flow statement. All right. We've been talking a lot about John Malone lately. I've been tweeting mm-hmm. about him a lot. I've been talking about telecommunication stocks. I think they're very interesting companies. I think John Malone is absolutely fascinating. I tweeted out recently a lecture he gave to college students. Mm -hmm. It was an hour and 40 minutes long, and it was one of the best lectures I've heard probably in a very long time. My favorite thing about it is this guy mentioned the word taxes probably like a hundred times in that video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he obviously factors that a lot in when he was building, you know, TCI and his company and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. Um, And I guess this relationship between the income statement to the cash flow statement, the best types of companies were really off the top of my mind though, uh, is telecommunication companies because there's such a discrepancy between reported earnings Mm -hmm. and cash flow from operations. Right. And we could also talk about some rural telecoms as well Mm -hmm. and kind of just go over the industry. I mean, what are your thoughts on telecom stocks in general? John Malone, Cable Cowboy? Uh, They're interesting. Value investors like them a lot. I'm not always sure about them because I'm not always sure that they've been cheap enough during my uh, investing lifetime. And I'm not always sure about the return they'll get on their reinvestment. Depends. Um, so yes, they have lots of cash flow from operations, but how much is their free cash flow? And it's fine if their free cash flow is nothing right now, if they're going to get a big return in the future because they're growing so fast. Um, but in other cases, they may not be. So that that's mostly the difference between sort of competitive ones and non-competitive uh, markets. People may know that I've talked a little bit about, um, it's called ATNI. No, it's called ATN International now. The ticker is ATNI. It, it was Atlantic Tele Network was his name for a long time. Uh, A-T-N-I. A-T-N-I. Yeah. There you go. So um, this is not a favorite stock of mine by any means, but I would suggest people read the um, annual letters. The annual letters are pretty Bermuda, good. Bermuda, Cayman Islands. Yes. So the main ones that they have is Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Guyana, and U.S. Virgin Islands. And in each of those places, they're like sort of monopoly, duopoly, like duopoly type things. Um, You know, uh, I mean, they may be the one who, yeah, basically duopoly type things. Like they may have started as the um, long distance one and now there's a, um, you know, so they have half the wireless one because they were the incumbent and then another one came in or they have half the video one because there was a cable thing and they're, uh, you know, have whatever other service or, but it, anyway, what I mean is that for many of the services they have, whether we're talking internet, wireless, uh, cable TV services, whatever, um, it's sort of like h- half and half. There's not going to be a lot more than that. So they're more attractive, uh, markets that they're in mm-hmm. the U S until recently, at least was one that among the very big telecom things, I wasn't always that excited by cause there were too many companies. So, I mean, I think you really should have two. Uh, in any given area. Uh, I don't think a country should generally have more than two um, competing telecom services in terms of each service mm-hmm. that they're offering. And that's how, I mean, like Nuvera, for example, I think they compete against Mediacom, which is where I grew up, mm-hmm. town of less than 6,000 people. Mm-hmm. Mediacom was one of the options. You know? Yeah. And I was talking to Vetla on the rundown about this, how it's interesting when I live in Dallas yeah. and I could get you know my Wi-Fi 100 megs mm-hmm. per second for a pretty cheap price, right? An mm-hmm. unlimited service. But then you and I talk about, right. you know, people you know, for example, mm-hmm. that it's like they're 20 years behind Dallas, for example, you know? Right. And so economically, that makes a lot of sense. So Dallas is similar to where I grew up and stuff. Very, very similar in terms of the market for how you would um, wire it and stuff. Cable makes the most sense by far. Uh, there is satellite and stuff, but satellite generally focuses more on rural things. It just happens to be here and stuff, but um, that's not a focus for it. But um, because it's very easy to very densely pack a network. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because of that, the the like the service area I grew up in was cable vision. And you may read a little bit about it and different things of you know how it's been bought and sold over the years. Um, but it's a pretty good franchise to have because of just how... Um, many houses you could pass with the cable and how much you could charge and stuff. The problem is, and this going back to Bermuda, I've mentioned a 
many years ago, a Bermuda water company. The reason why I mentioned Bermuda water company is because given that there's not like other sources of water on Bermuda and stuff of fresh water and stuff and how high income it is and how densely packed it is, you have a service area that might be 60,000 population or whatever the population of Bermuda is not big, but it's in a really um, small area that you can cover. So you don't have a lot of assets. The problem of why in rural areas you have bad service and stuff, why you would have to is because without massive um, government spending to subsidize you, there's no legitimate business reason of why you should ever run cable up there and stuff. So, but in the United States they do. So the government does subsidize things. And, and, and um, I think it's new Vera. They are getting like 80 million over the next 10 mm-hmm. years, which is their market caps, 80 million. And Atlanta tele network did some stuff where they did the same kind of thing, I think under different program and stuff, but um, they basically did some rural stuff where they had kind of a guaranteed return. And so they weren't using their own shareholder money on it. And then say you get a 6% return or something, then you've made money. Um, so you're basically using government capital to get a decent return on things. The reason why I mentioned ATNI uh, is because I think they have a focus on less competitive type things and a real capital allocation focus. As you see there, which is unusual, I think you can see if it's correct. Yep, PS and EVS shows you. Um, it's one of the only telecom companies I know of that has a net cash position. Not only does it have a net cash position, some of the debt is non-recourse. So they've been very good that way. So mm-hmm. that the um, the company is severely overcapitalized for telecom, yeah. So what's interesting about these businesses is they probably, you know, people could look and be like, return on assets, return on equity, return yep. on, it's all very low, but that's because, you know, you're taking on like the net income number. So it's right. like here, they don't have, they don't break it down, but you know, they're showing a loss, right? EPS, but right. then you look at their cash flow statement and, you know, 2 million in net income, right to 88 million in cash flow from operations. So like that discrepancy there. And a lot of it is because, and which John Malone has talked a lot about, is the DNA. Yes. So here we have a good example of the issue that comes up, right? So the issue that comes up is we see cash flow from operations. Um, This is not an incredibly cheap one. It's not like the rural ones you're talking about and stuff. The cash flow from operations here is running at, let's say, 120 million, 100, yeah, something like that. So last few years, it's been running at like 120 million. We just said, what's the market cap? 800 million, something like that. It's enterprise value and market cap are the same. Um, Basically, so 800 800 million, million. yeah. So we're talking about a situation in which it's like, you know, um, six, seven, whatever times um, cash flow from operations. Uh, But the... CapEx, as you can see, is interesting. So the CapEx here is really fascinating. They had been spending no more than about $60 million, Then they went back to spending a lot less. But in between, they spent um, $135 million, $180 million, $180 million, basically, right? Mm-hmm. In addition to doing acquisitions and things like that. But that's an incredible amount of CapEx to the point that they had no free cash flow. Mm-hmm. And that's the other difference with these businesses. When you look at them on a cash flow basis, that you have to think about is sometimes they put a lot of cash into it. Now, other companies, John Malone's company, uh, when he was building up the kale business was TCI, they just didn't put money back into it at all. Yeah. So they acquired You're things. Problems with that but they, yeah, yeah, but you don't put money back into it. So that's the difference is, is that money being put back into it at a good investment? And that's always my concern with these things. So the cash flow from operations is absolutely good. And we can see, you could show a ton that have great EV to EBITDA. Mm-hmm. But I, EV to EBITDA depends on what you're putting that EBITDA back into. You know, Mm -hmm. so when I've mentioned before, like um, that, I liked uh, uh, NACO or whatever. Right. The important thing is they weren't putting the money back into um, Lignite. Right. Mm -hmm. They're putting into other things. So I'd value free. I value cash flow from operations much more if I know it's not being spent on CapEx related to mines that I might not like that business. Same thing here with any of these telecom things. It's great that they have a lot of EBITDA. They have a lot of cash flow from operations. I would focus on cash flow from operations instead of EBITDA because we can see the cash flow statements, but that's fine. Um, but what are they spending it on? And is it a high enough return investment? Mm-hmm. But I don't know how they account for it. But mm-hmm. this pp e like this CapEx, for example, mm-hmm. isn't like, for example, they're getting grants from the government for like 80 million, like I said, right. over the next 10 years. So I wonder how much of that is actually their cash that they're putting in versus using subsidized money from the government yes exactly and then it's just a question of whether they whether you get a good return on that uh that's pretty easy to analyze the possible return that you get on that um you got to be a little careful on those things because if you ever make agreement it may make promises and things to do other stuff you can really lead yourself down a not good way like what we were talking about um 
is, uh, you know, well, you can run yourself into some trouble um, because you took on things that were economically not of interest to you. Um, so you may have done it for reasons, you know, to, to win that, that in the long run aren't a benefit to you. Um, but it should be fine. Why do you think some of these companies do appear to like trade cheap? Like you could look at even like LICT, for example. I think they use all of their, that's a Mario Gabelli. Yeah. They use all of their free cash to really just buy back their stock. Right. The perception has to be that the, um, that their CapEx versus their future growth is going to be not a good mix, basically. So um, they are expecting them not to be growth stocks, but are expecting them to have to put in CapEx. So if you grew a lot with high CapEx and stuff, it could be justified. And then if you um, had like almost no CapEx, mm -hmm. that could be justified too. But they all these companies do have very high, I mean, most of these companies have very high CapEx versus their cash flow from operations. So you have to be careful about whether they're um, justified, they're, whether the EV to EBITDA is the right measure to use. Mm -hmm. um, be, because it depends on how good the return that they're getting is on what they're doing. Um, remember when we talked about like John Malone and stuff, he wasn't spending it on on um, giving the latest um, upgrades to cable things and stuff. Mm -hmm. What he was doing is taking and buying another cable service, you know, over and over again, but buying more and more subscribers. Um, so you could get an idea on what that return on capital is. The problem here is if that return on capital isn't that great of your reinvestment and the fact that your EBITDA, your EV to EBITDA is low doesn't really uh, impress me versus other companies that might have similar EV to EBITDA. Mm -hmm. How do you typically think about, because, you know, Stock investing aside, mm -hmm. you and I were talking about some stuff where we're like, okay, if you own a private business, mm -hmm. do you, you don't care about reported profits. All you no. care about is cash flow. Right. Right. So, but in investing, we have the income statement, for example, mm -hmm. you know, so it's almost like, you know, free cash flow is what we all focus on. Right. What are your thoughts on, you know, going from the income statement to the cash flow statement? Like, should people really start to focus more on, I mean, we always talk about free cash flow, but like net operating cash flow? As yeah. opposed to like reported profits, because here's the thing, right? If you looked at any telecom company, even charter communications, mm -hmm. the income statement, you know, probably doesn't look that great. But until you get to the cash flow statement, you can see, well, they're actually generating a ton of cash. They're just taking yeah. advantage of tax write offs and stuff like that. Yeah. To me, what matters is the cash flow statement. Uh, it really doesn't matter what the income statement is. The income statement may help you understand the cash flow statement in some ways, just like the balance sheet may. Um, all those things together will help you. Uh, the cash flow statement on its own is the most informative statement because it also has information like, for one, it shows you what net income and stuff was, but it also shows you the changes in the different working capital things and all that kind Which of stuff. Which are hints about the business. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the CapEx and all that sort of stuff. So it gives the most information of any statement. And I think if you were going to analyze a business on one bit of information, one statement alone, it would have to be the cash flow statement. But uh, there are some issues because it could... The income statement stuff, I guess, could be helpful in cases in which they're sort of like um, milking the business for its cash, I guess you could say. Um, so could there be situations in which the fact that the income statement is so poor is helpful in understanding it from a cash flow perspective? Maybe. I don't think so, really. I think you just want to be careful not to just use free cash flow. That is one thing that worries me a little bit when I talk to some value investors and stuff. They're like, oh, free cash flow is $13 million or whatever. You know, yes, but like... Um, have has cash flow from operations been going down over time? Have sales been going down? Has mm -hmm. gross profit been going down? Um, are they using more capital to generate less free cash flow? Are they, you know, all those things that you would think about as a business? Yeah, it's like a lot of companies, and we talk about bankrupt companies. Mm -hmm. They all generate free cash flow right before they're about to go bankrupt right. because yeah, they yeah. stop putting in cash flow. You, 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 need to, you need to generate cash, exactly. Yeah. Which is interesting because, of course, we looked at some businesses that were cash flow, at least from a cash flow from operations perspective, positive right up until the end. Yeah. And then they had to declare bankruptcy, which uh -huh. is interesting. Um, you know, but the way I see it, like a lot of these companies, they all generate a ton of cash. Right. And then it's almost, I don't know what, you know, why they started to decline. I mean, this is in Alaska. Right. But their legacy business is declining and they're investing a lot in fiber, which is this new and new, I mean, new as of the past maybe five years or right. whatever, they're almost, they were forced to invest in their business and sort of shift gears. Um, but the multiples on these companies are just, it's what is intriguing to me because right. of the cash flow generation. I mean, but does it just, 
I don't know, like at some point, right? We were talking to Vester once mm -hmm. and he was like, at some point, I mean, the value of cash flow, it, it is worth something. Sure. You know, and you look at some of these companies and they're just trading. I mean, you could use EV to EBITDA or whatever you want to use. And when it's trading, you know, three times or two times, it just makes you think like, gosh, is this one of the, is this a melting ice cube or is it really the multiples severely contracted in this industry because of the consolidation or because they were forced to invest in, you know, their businesses or people are worried about future growth or anything like that. I mean, at what point is it? Right. Like, wow, this really starts to look pretty interesting, you know? Well, it's looks cheap, right? So we're looking at Alaska communications right now, a L S K it looks cheap on like a current basis, right? Mm -hmm. But it has attributes if you look at the last 10 years, which if we didn't know what kind of business it was, would cause it to be quite cheap. So yeah. if we look at this and then we type in like, uh, type in, what is it, BKE? Buck what's Buckle's ticker? Yeah, Buckle. Yeah. You can see what I mean here. It has certain similarities. Um, and of course, these businesses have nothing to do with each other and stuff. I'm just pointing out mm -hmm. why, this, why this would happen. Yeah. So Buckle actually has done much better on a gross profit basis and an operating profit basis somewhat better of not declining as much. So this business has actually declined. Alaska's communications has declined more in 10 years than Buckle has. So in some ways, it's not necessarily that the market isn't the market is more harsh on Buckle than it is on Alaska communications. If based on the financials. And I don't think they're necessarily wrong on that. They're obviously concerned about the durability and stuff like that of Buckle versus they're not as concerned about that with a telecom company. But the reason why both of them look like that is because you've had declines in the key business indicators, particularly like declines in gross profit. In fact, like I said, Buckle is not maybe quite as bad as Alaska Communications. But if you have a business that for like gross profit has declined over 10 year period or whatever. So the company has really shrunk in terms of its potential profit for the most part. Um, then that's a really big concern to the market. And that mm -hmm. may be why it, it trades that cheaply. Um, a lot of these, I would say have had a 10 year decline mm -hmm. in gross profits and things like that. But like you said, that could be a technology thing. Yeah. It's there were the, uh, most of their legacy businesses are declining, but it's like their fiber businesses, you know, right. so it's like, okay, I think it was even Alaska or maybe it was new Bear when they're talking about it. I think it was actually Alaska. As long as their legacy business, you know, declines at the industry average and mm -hmm. their fiber business continues to do, you know, great. Cause it's like Nuvera. I think they're in Minnesota uh -huh. and they, oh, and this is, uh, yeah, they're uh, in New uh, Ulm, right? That yeah. was what they were called uh -huh. originally, I think. And then, you know, like Alaska, for example, they're in Alaska and there's only right. one other person there, Liberty. Yes. Our, our form, you know, one of yeah, his, yeah. his stocks or whatever. So it's a two, two person state. Yeah. 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 You know, um, so that's why I'm like, huh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. You know? I think Hawaii's similar. I, oh, what was their name? I forget. No, the name they got the bought up by trade. CBB. I thought Okay, yeah. Cincinnati something, something. Yeah. Yeah. They got bought. Um, up. Yeah. Cause I looked at them as a comp for Atlanta Tele network and those things. I mean the, the obvious ones to look for, for yeah, so Cincinnati Bell. AT and I, um, because it owned these duopoly things in certain places, the things that I looked for as comps for the company were um, Hawaii, Alaska, rural parts of the U.S., uh, very rural where there was, like we've talked about before, where there's basically, in most cases, it's really just one company that's then working with a um, national carrier, you know? Uh, like, for instance, you were talking about um, a rural area that I visit all the time and stuff. And um, they had a contract dispute with um, the local carrier with AT&T. And when that happened, there was no service outside of town. Wow. Uh, and when I say outside of town, it's half an hour drive to town, at least at 70 miles an hour. So um, you didn't have any service, which was a big problem, but it's a big problem for the national carrier, right? Because it is actually really bad. It paints AT&T in a really bad light that way because it's like you basically took away their phone service and stuff. And AT&T really has only one party they can negotiate with. I mean, like that company is going to either do a deal with AT&T or do a deal with Verizon, you know? Um, they're the really only choice if you want to have your national service have service in that area. Um, so we did that to compare it to things like... Um, uh, that were smaller markets that had a couple players in them, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, Nuvera, though, if you notice on a uh, uh, on their quick FS stuff, right, is completely different from Alaska Communications in that they have consistent growth over time, mm -hmm. fairly consistent growth in things like gross profit and revenue. Yeah, they Not did acquire great. a new company, I think like in 16 or 17, okay. which, which is that jump. Yeah, 
not great. Um, and gross margin has been shrinking throughout that whole period, but positive throughout that whole time so that you don't have real meaningful declines that way. I looked up their HQ online and it reminded mm-hmm. me of the town I grew up in. It was just like, yeah, well, it looked like just one of those, like if you were going through like a rural town, they have like their city, you know, it's like a two lane road mm-hmm. and it's just there. It was kind of looked like it was in the middle so of the town center. So if we look center. at their cash flow statement here, we can get some idea for it. Um, you can see that cash flow from operations the last three years. Um, yeah, that was the acquisition they did in here. Okay. So, you know, they've been able to do, um, let's say around 20, you know, let's, let's assume that it could be around 20 million cash from operations. Then the question is just how much CapEx. There was very little CapEx in the past, mm-hmm. right, compared to that. So you could be generating a lot. Um, some of these have a lot of debt, though. Yeah, they, Nuvera, from reading their most recent quarterly reports and stuff, mm-hmm. and through COVID, they seem very much more conservative, I'll say, than some of these. Okay. Um, they suspended their dividend. I think it was like a two or three percent dividend yield. But mm-hmm. I mean, you could do the math on you know just doing like free cash flow pl- plus growth. You don't need a lot to get a a fifth like a better than market return. I think over the next ten years, right. better than you know like I think I was doing it and I was doing a bunch of different ones, just very conservative. Like okay, let's say they put their dividend back on you know in two thousand twenty one. Um, you know, you get your two or three percent there. EV to free cash flow, you get a good yield there. How much do you need to you know, I was kind of doing algebra on it. And I just from some very basic assumptions, I was getting 15 plus percent returns. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The one thing that's tough for me here is to be honest, you know, this is a podcast about all the stack options out there. It's very hard to see why you should invest in a telecom company instead of a bank. <laughs> <laughs> because their prices are the same. The telecom on a like cash flow from opera, like cash flow operations is a meaningful thing for a bank. But what I mean is they're, they're free cash. We don't use free cash flow really for banks either, but they're the amount of capital they could pay out if they stayed the same size in both cases or whatever is similar or less in the case of banks. Like you're getting at a better yield initially if they were just going to all dividend you everything out. Mm-hmm. And yet the telecom is reinvesting in hard assets that have worse returns than the bank. I mean, the telecom will not get 15% type returns, whereas we can find banks that can get that. Now we can find banks that get five, but. How would you think about the argument? Well, their capex is being subsidized by the government for the next ten years, which also kind of is scary, right? What if that doesn't renew? Like, what happens then? But I mean, how would right. you think about that? No, that's argument? justifiable that they could create value yeah. that way, sure. But on, the I same- mean, what do you do? You just take like that PV of like eighty million over the next ten years? I don't even know how you would go about yeah. doing that. Yeah, but we have to remember, banks just because of the Federal Reserve are being subsidized in the sense that they can just accept money that they wouldn't otherwise accept. You can now. Take, take wholesale type money. You can take in CDs and things like that. Mm-hmm. We're paying vir- virtually nothing short term. If you're willing to borrow short and lend long, you're being subsidized by the government mm-hmm. that way now too, um, as opposed to having to actually use deposits like that customer deposits. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that it's that some of them are pretty cheap that way. But it does. It is of interest to me that I don't think any of them are cheaper than banks would be, and the banks will grow faster. The banks will definitely grow. Fa- I mean, some the good banks will grow faster. Um, we'll see. You know, uh, it just because the returns on capital would be higher that way because it's a pure cash business. The, the problem with the telecom thing to me is there's so much investment in hard assets. Mm-hmm. that it can be a tough business that way in particular i don't know if it's that great a business without high enough inflation um compared to other businesses it doesn't help it to have high inflation but it helps it versus other businesses i watched like a i don't know if it was a 60 minutes but it was like mm-hmm. this old alaska communications how they get internet to there mm-hmm. so it's literally wire that they put in the ocean right at the ground and you know they wire it to i think they do oregon or something like that okay so it's kind of fascinating. But I mean, look at this market cap of Charter. So this mm-hmm. is 2009. So I guess we're cherry picking right. it, but that's what we all we have. 4 billion to 101 billion, the present. And, yeah. that's, and that's 2019. So it's probably even more. Now. Right. I don't know what it currently is. So but. Charter is an example of something that's all about the capital allocation, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So if we look here. Um, 127 we, now. That's yeah. crazy. But if we look, let's see, if we go to the... Um, Let's see, use the cash flow statement. But this is when we're talking about TCI and stuff, that's, you know, Charter follows that sort of pattern. It doesn't have earnings at all and stuff, but it has meaningful amounts of, um, of uh, 
free cash flow and cash flow from operations, huge cash flow from operations, obviously. So recently you're talking about like 12 million in cash flow from oper- cash flow from operations, <laughs> 12 billion, sorry, in cash flow from operations. <laughs> you just used to micro cap companies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you only have like three to 5 billion in free cash flow actually, um, which then is used on stock buybacks, right? So um, the stock buyback thing, you know, gives a question of like how, what exactly are they doing there? Um, I think what they're doing is targeting a certain debt level and stuff. If we look, Mm -hmm. so if we go to the balance sheet, we could probably see that better. Um, yeah. And that video that I shared of John Malone giving a lecture, he talked about, he's like, yeah, you're kind of weighing your debt to EBITDA and your equity to EBITDA or debt, you know? So they have 78 billion, I guess in debt, something like that. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll go with 78 billion. Let's call it 80 billion. Um, and they've no retained earnings, by the way, just so people know. Um, so they have eighty billion in in debt and cash flow from operations. We said was what in the most recent um, twelve billion, thirteen billion, uh, right? Billion. Yeah, twelve billion. Yeah. So you know, twelve billion. What we just said, it's really the seventy-eight. Uh, billion in debt, I guess. Oh, they have how much cash do they have? Seventy-five billion. Let's say it's seventy-five billion. Three point four billion in, in net cash, in net debt. So seventy-five. Um, so yeah, I mean we're talking about six, seven times um, debt to cash flow from operations, which isn't even EBITDA. But um, so I, I would use cash flow from operations now on an EBITDA basis. People would say that's a little bit different because remember in the U S uh, cash flow from operations is already taking into account those sorts of things mm-hmm. um, that you have available to, to pay on that. Like what I mean by that is interest in taxes. If you look at a lot of the transaction multiples in this industry mm-hmm. too, it's all like eight times. EBITDA. Okay. Right. Um, and that was, I guess you talked a little bit about with Vetla is that, so you have these big systems and things that trade for very high EVD EBITDA or for high EVD EBITDA. And then you have ones that are smaller ones that trade for less. Yeah. I mean, if I was a big one with a multiple of 12 times, I would just be buying up all these regional ones or rural runs that are like three to four. I'm like, then you get that multiple re-rating. Into yeah. Your so it could be because it's a big giant liquid stock and all that. It can also be for the capital allocation. So they like what they're doing, their debt and all those sorts of things. Or it can be that they're buying it on the free cash flow yield type thing. So we can look at that. Let's see. Uh, we just said, what do they have? Three to five? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Three to five billion in free cash flow uh, the last two years, if this is right, uh, versus a market cap of a hundred and yeah. So that's billion. a very low leverage free cash flow yield. And then you have a lot of debt on it. So yeah. 44. Yeah. So it's like what? Two and a half times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Charter doesn't look like one that I'd be buying, but um, but it looks like the kind of cap allocation. What did they do see. right here? They, what did they acquire? Charter or merge. Whatever. Charter merged into and acquired things that were like bigger than it. Yeah. Um, by significantly. Well, you can see that. Well, I don't know. Does the business description give you the list of all the things that they did? No, it doesn't. It's like the series of how they did it. Sometimes things like that do that, uh-huh. like Value Line does that. So they give you like, you know, in 2017, they bought this. In 2018, they bought this. In 2019, they merged with this. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, been, it's been fun to learn about the Cable Cowboys recently and John Malone and even like Ted Turner and, you know, yeah. him at CNN. And it was fascinating. Yeah. So they have a, a way of allocating things that would, you know, give people give people hope that their returns will be high because they're buying back stock and things, which is obviously a better uh, way of spending it than some things doing the CapEx and everything. And that, you know, so other things may not really be that cheap versus, like I would say, even though I mentioned Atlanta, uh, ATNI versus Charter and stuff, I don't think ATNI is like necessarily cheaper than Charter in a lot of ways because there is the risk that it just holds on to like the cash that it has and stuff like that, that it just sits without leveraging. And so then you don't have an amazing return from that. Um, Whereas this one could be putting it all back to use over and over again. So on a leverage basis, it may not really be cheaper. Like you said, it's free cash flow yield plus growth. Mm -hmm. So Charter's free cash flow yield is not high, but um, its growth might be high given what it, you know, um, given the way that it's investing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was doing it with Nuvera, just doing Mm -hmm. the algebra on it, I was like, okay, I was really using the current free cash flow yield mm-hmm. and the dividend and the growth and thinking, well, you don't really even need much of a multiple expansion. If you do get the multiple expansion, Correct. That, would, that would be really good. No, but you, you definitely don't, need, don't need multiple expansion in these sorts of things. Yeah. So, you know, but it's like we said, in terms of the research, the research that's tough is you have to understand the industry and stuff, which I may not, and the local area. 
and what the competition might be. I mean, to me, my big one would be what's the appetite of management to do CapEx and stuff like that. And then what's the aggressiveness of competitors and stuff in the area. Yeah, they if brought it's a- low. If the rivalry is low, I think you could potentially have very good, uh, a very good, industry to invest in and stuff but if it's high then i would be worried yeah yeah i think the ceo of these companies would is very important because it's like i think they brought out a new ceo nuvera and just reading the bio about him i think he was in like a sales position or something like that and mm-hmm. i was like hmm interesting because i don't know you if you have the right capital allocator and he very well might be i'm, I'm not sure but if you had the right capital all- allocator at these companies like if you were running this business you would probably think a lot differently about it than some people would that don't have a capital allocator's background, if you will, you know? Yeah, that's true. And you can see that new Vera, the same as other ones that we've mentioned is run very differently from, uh, the way that charters run, obviously mm-hmm. they're reporting a lot more. And I mean, they're reporting a lot of EBIT actually They're Uh, they've tripled their EBIT in the last three or four years, which you don't, um, you know, you don't want to report a lot of that because your earnings per share, you know, I mean, like we said, I, I think earnings per share tripled. Yeah. So, earnings per share tripling means you pay a lot more taxes mm-hmm. yeah you were talking about i mean when john malone was talking about actually when, yeah. you know they'd fully depreciate something it was like mm-hmm. time to sell it yes <laughs> you know yeah yeah and so you're you are paying a lot more in tax it's a lot less efficient but then from that perspective i guess people could always argue okay well then why i mean it's tiny and stuff but then why don't companies like charter or whatever buy companies like nuvera mm-hmm. they do sometimes i guess but um eventually is that your exit you know so like do you ever deserve a multiple um, being less for a company using less debt and stuff, it really matters for the speed of how much they compound value while you're invested in them. But presumably they'll all be bought out at an EV to EBITDA basis, not on like a, um, uh, without taking into account, uh, the leverage and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if someone was going to buy, uh, give the example, like, um, Nuvera or, or ATNI or whatever, they would put debt on it. If they were going to do the purchase, they'd use debt to buy it. So at that point, does it matter that it's less leveraged than other companies? I guess not. But it matters in your path of getting there. As you can see with Charter, you can get there a lot faster if you use a lot of debt. Yeah. Got it. Cool. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter if you're not already. And definitely check out the Focus Compounding app either on Google Play or the iOS store. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you in the next podcast.